Good morning, everyone. This morning, we're going to be looking at King Josiah. Uh, he was only a young fellow when he became king, and he definitely needed God's help, just like we do. So as we have a look at this, let's ask God for his help. Heavenly Father, as we open your word this morning, we pray that you would open our hearts, open our minds. Father, we pray that you would speak to us this morning from your word and that what we hear will be what we need to hear. Father, each one of us is different and each one of us has something different to learn. And Father, we do pray that you would speak to us and help us not only to listen, but then to put into practice what you've got to say to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be looking first up at uh, Second Chronicles chapter 34. And in verse 1, it says, Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for 31 years. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the right or to the left. In the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father, David. Josiah was one of the good kings. It says here, he walked in the ways of his father, David. The term father actually means ancestor, because uh, David wasn't his father as we use the term father. And while he was still young, in the eighth year, he began to seek the God of his father, David. There is no comment which would indicate a reason for him to be, begin to seek after the God of David. His father was Ammon, and we heard about him very shortly last week. His father was Ammon, who did evil in the sight of the Lord. But he was only king for only two years. And that means that for six years, Josiah lived under the kingship of his grandfather, who was Manasseh. And during those six years, how much he saw or knew about Manasseh's repentance and clearing away the altars and high places in Jerusalem is not known, but he was probably aware of it. In 2 Kings, it mentions the name of his mother but there's no mention or suggestion as to whether she may have had an influence on his life. But after he'd been king for eight years, in other words, when he was 16, he began to seek after God. And in the 12th year, four years later, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of high places. And there's quite some significant comments with regard to the work that he did in that and in second Kings chapter 22 i'm going to read this passage from verse 4 it says the king ordered hilkiah the high priest the priests next in rank and the doorkeepers to remove from the temple of the lord all the articles made for baal and asherah and all the starry hosts he burned them outside jerusalem in the fields of the kidron valley and took the ashes to Bethel. He did away with the pagan priests appointed by the kings of Judah to burn incense on the high places of the towns of Judah and those around Jerusalem. Those who burned incense to Baal, to the sun and moon, to the constellations and to all the starry hosts. He took the Asherah pole from the temple of the Lord to the Kidron Valley outside Jerusalem and burned it there. He ground it to powder and scattered the dust over the graves of the common people. He also tore down the quarters of the male shrine prostitutes, which were in the temple of the Lord and where the women did weaving for Asherah. Josiah brought all the priests from the towns of Judah and desecrated the high places from Geba to Beersheba, where the priests had burned incense. He broke down the shrines at the gates, at the entrance to the gate of Joshua, the city governor, which is on the left of the city gate. 
Although the priests of the high places did not serve at the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem, they ate unleavened bread with their fellow priests. He desecrated Topheth, which was in the valley of Ben Hinnom, so no one could use it to sacrifice his son or daughter in the fire of Molech. He removed from the entrance to the temple of the Lord the horses that the kings of Judah had dedicated to the sun. They were in the court near the room of an official named Nathan Melech. Josiah burned the chariots dedicated to the sun. He pulled down the altars the kings of Judah had erected on the roof near the upper room of Ahaz and the altars of Manasseh, or sorry, the altars Manasseh had built in the two courts of the temple of the Lord. He removed them from there, smashed them to pieces and threw the rubble into the Kidron Valley. The king also desecrated the high places that were east of Jerusalem on the south of the hill of corruption, the ones Solomon, king of Israel, had built for Ashtoreth, the vile goddess of the Sidonians, for Shemosh, the vile god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the people of Ammon. Josiah smashed the sacred stones and cut down the Asherah poles and covered the sites with human bones. Even at the altar at Bethel, the high place made by Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who caused Israel to sin, even that altar and high place he demolished. He burned the high place and ground it to powder and buried the Asherah pole and burned the Asherah pole also. Then Josiah looked around and when he saw the tombs that were there on the hillside, he had the bones removed from them and burned on the altar to defile it. In accordance with the word of the Lord, proclaimed by the man of God who foretold these things. The king asked, what is that tombstone I see? And the men of the city said, it marks the tomb of the man of God who came from Judah and pronounced against the altar of Bethel the very things that you have done to it. Leave it alone, he said. Don't let anyone disturb his bones. So they spared his bones and those of the prophet who had come from Samaria. Just as he had done Bethel, Josiah removed and defiled all the shrines at the high places that the kings of Israel had built in the towns of Samaria that had provoked the Lord to anger. Josiah slaughtered all the priests of those high places on the altars and burned human bones on them. Then he went back to Jerusalem. Wow. What a job he had. Baal and Asherah were both believed to be connected with fertility. By being involved with temple prostitutes, it was believed that this would result in greater fertility. Better yields of your crops and with your sheep and goats and other animals. Some previous kings had removed altars and high places, but later people had rebuilt them. However, jo Josiah removed the altars and the high places, but he went further. Instead of just burning them and then leaving it like that, he burnt the poles and crushed the idols and then spread the powder over the graves of common people. He also burnt bones and spread the ashes over the altars and the high places. Anything that was connected with a dead body was considered to be unclean. And by spreading the ashes over the high places and places of worship, that would make them unclean and so the people would not go back and set things up again. He desecrated all those idols by spreading the ashes over them. He burnt all the idolatrous articles from the temple in New Jerusalem outside the walls. He took them outside Jerusalem, not inside. And it's interesting that most of what he did was in the Kidron Valley. The Kidron Valley is where there's, I think they said it's the biggest grave site, cemetery site in, in um, Israel. So there's all the dead bones, dead people there. But as well as that, the Kidron Valley is where all the drainage and sewerage comes from Jerusalem. When it rains, it washes out all the streets and the gutters and all the rest, and that goes down into the Kidron Valley. The Kidron Valley wasn't 
a place where you go for a holiday. The Kidron Valley was unclean permanently. And Josiah took the things out there and burned them out there. And then he would take the ashes and he went up to Bethel. When Judah and Israel separated, Jeroboam set up a, an altar at Bethel. And that was to stop the people from Israel or to encourage the people from Israel to not go down to Jerusalem to the temple to worship. They could go to Bethel to worship. And Josiah comes along and he destroys that temple, puts ashes over it, human bones on it to make it completely unclean. And after Josiah had done all this, there's no record that that the people of Israel set up any idols or anything like that in all the high places as they had previously done. And it says there that he brought all the priests from Geba to Beersheba. Geba was on the boundary of the north, the northern boundary of Judah. Beersheba was on the southern boundary. So it's saying in Chronicles, it's saying that in all the area of Judah, Josiah got to and he destroyed and desecrated all these temples, all these high places. However, when we read in 2 Chronicles, it says he burned the bones of the priests on their altars and so he purged Judah and Jerusalem. And then in verse 6 it says, in the towns of Manasseh, Ephraim and Simeon, and as far as Naphtali, and in the ruins around them. He tore down the altars and the Asherah poles and crushed the idols to powder and cut to pieces all the incense altars throughout Israel. Even though he was the king of Judah, Israel had been taken off to Babylon. There was no kings or anything there. And he extended the area of his influence to Manasseh and Ephraim. They were in the middle of Israel not Judah, they were in the middle part of Israel. But then there was Simeon. And when I looked at the map, I was rather puzzled about this because the tribe of Simeon, the area that they took up, was south of Judah. So there was the tribe of Simeon down the bottom, but then it went as far north as Naphtali. Naphtali was the tribe which was right at the top of Israel. So the influence of Josiah wasn't just Judah. He also covered the whole of the land that was the kingdom of Israel. And just like the people in Josiah's time were worshipping what they thought would give them a successful and profitable life, we need to be aware that we can fall into the same trap. We can be worshipping our jobs, our investments, our houses, our cars, the people we associate with and their values to give us a successful and profitable life rather than trusting God. It may be that those areas are a problem and maybe God will need to defile them so that we will leave them and don't go back to them. We need to make sure we don't just focus on Jerusalem. Don't just focus on what we do on Sunday. We need to focus on the whole of our lives, from the north to the south in our lives, every area of it. We need to make sure that there's nothing in our lives that would distract us or cause us to turn away from trusting God with all the different things that come in our lives. One of the problems that the children of Israel had was following the practices of the Canaanites and that was the Baal and the Asherah. They were following those practices. They were the practices of the people who had previously controlled the land. And I think that very shortly, very shortly, we here in Australia are going to have to face exactly the same thing. The government is bringing in laws and recommendations to get people to be involved in two things. One is 
a welcome to country, and the other is acknowledgement of country. Both of these are ceremonies by the Indigenous people of Australia. That's the religion of the people of the Indigenous people of Australia. And to be involved in those activities is an acknowledgement that the beliefs and spiritual practices of the Indigenous people is true. And in 2 Kings, God says that these actions, that these beliefs are an abomination. We might look at them, I mean, the government often says, you know, this is the Aboriginal culture. They avoid to saying that it's their religion to try and persuade us, think, oh, yeah, it's all right. It's not. God says in 2 Kings chapter 21, but he did evil in the sight of the Lord according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. God says that all those things, the acknowledgement of that is an abomination. And God does not treat lightly the acknowledgement of false gods. And this is happening in Australia at the same time that the government is bringing in laws, making certain Christian activities illegal or criminal. In Victoria, it can be a criminal activity to pray for someone in certain situations. That's serious, isn't it? Australia is not and never was a Christian country. We did have a lot of Christian basis on things. But it's really turning against God. Josiah went around and he cleaned up all these places of worship. But then his focus on the, was on the worship of God. And in his case, it was the repairs to the temple. The temple had been used for so much other stuff and it needed to be purified in verse 8 we read in um, second chronicles chapter 34 and verse 8 we read in the 18th year of josiah's reign to purify the land of the temple he went to shaphan son of azaliah and maaseh the ruler of the city and joah the son of joah has the recorder to repair the temple of the Lord his God. They went to Hilkiah the high priest and gave him the money that had been brought into the temple of God, which the Levites, who were the doorkeepers, had collected from the people of Manasseh, Ephraim, and the entire remnant of Israel, and from the people of Judah and Benjamin, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Then they entrusted it to the men appointed to supervise the work of the Lord's temple. These men paid the workers who repaired and restored the temple. They also gave money to the carpenters and builders to purchase dress stone and timber for joists and be beams for the buildings that the kings of Judah had allowed to fall into ruin. The men did the work faithfully. Over them to direct them were Jahath and Obadiah, Levites descended from Merari and Zechariah and Meshalem descended from Kohath. The Levites, all who were skilled in playing the musical instruments, had charge of the laborers and supervised all the workers from job to job. Some of the Levites were secretaries, scribes and doorkeepers. It wasn't only Josiah who did the work of restoring the temple. And it wasn't only the Levites. And it wasn't only those in Jerusalem or those from Ju Judah. Those from the area which was the kingdom of Israel were also involved in contributing and working to restore the temple. They all worked together, faithfully doing the work allocated to them. And this is a good picture of the church. In the Old Testament, the temple was the place where God dwelt. But this changed after Jesus was raised 
After Jesus' resurrection, God dwells in people, not in buildings. This building is not the house of God. There is nothing in the Bible to support the idea that this building is the house of God. In fact, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, Paul says to Timothy, he says, If I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. That's people. From New Testament times, the Lord Jesus and God live in people, not in buildings. We are the temple of God. We are the place where God dwells. We are the house of God and we need to be restored. And God uses his people, the members of his body, in the work of restoring us. We all need each other. And God uses us to help others. While they were bringing it in verse 14, while they were bringing out the money that had been taken into the temple of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord that had been given through Moses. Hilkiah said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. And he gave it to Shaphan. Then Shaphan took the book to the king and reported to him, your officials are doing everything that's been committed to them. They have paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord and have entrusted it to the supervisors and workers. Then Shaphan the secretary informed the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read from it in the presence of the Lord, in the presence of the king. Josiah had been seeking the God of his father David what he had found resulted in his cleansing of the land and rebuilding of the temple. And then they found the book of the law of the Lord. They didn't frame it and put it up so that it could be worshipped. Shaphan read the book of the law to the king. And from Josiah's comment, it appeared that Shaphan read the whole book now, if it was the first five books of the Old Testament, that's not a five-minute read. But he read it. He read the book of the law of the Lord. It's one thing to hear what men understand. It's one thing for you to listen to what I've got to say and to say, oh, yeah, that sounds good. Or oh, I don't agree with that. It's quite another thing for you to hear what God has to say as a result of what I'm saying. And I pray that you hear what God says. Because what God says that has the effect on our lives, and it's important. When Josiah heard the word, heard God's word, what a difference there was to his reaction. Before that, he'd been out and cleansed and pounded stuff to pieces. And now he hears God's word. And it's the same with us. We can come along to church and listen to some good teaching, which can cause us to make some changes in our lives. But we need to hear God's word. We need to read it for ourselves. The Apostle Paul basically says, don't just believe what I said. Search the scriptures to make sure that what I said is what God says. And it doesn't matter who it is that stands up here whether it's Alan, and he's not here this morning, or Kevin, or Richard, or Albert, or me. Doesn't matter who's standing up here. Make sure that you check out what we say. Because it's what God says that's important. And it's what God says that's true. And as I was reading this, and thinking about the fact that Shaphan had stood there and he'd read the whole of the law of the Lord. Now, if that was just the book of Leviticus, I'm guessing that could have been maybe four or five hours. But if he read the whole five books, that's a considerable time. 
and it impressed on me how important it is to hear what God has to say. And that's the reason why I've been reading more rather than, well, so often we say, um, for the sake of time, I'll just read a couple of verses. And as I thought about it, I thought, hmm, so we minimize the amount of what God says so that we can maximize the amount that I say. I don't want that to happen. I want you to hear what God has to say. When Josiah heard God's words, it touched his heart like a sledgehammer. In verse 19, when the king heard the words of the law, he tore his robes. And there's a bit more description further down. He gave orders to Hilkiah, Anakim, son of Shaphan, Abdon, son of Micah, Shaphan, the secretary, and, Az and Isaiah, the king's attendant. He said, go and inquire of the Lord for me, for the remnant of Israel and Judah, about what is written in this book that has been found. Great is the Lord's anger that is poured out on us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord. They have not acted in accordance with all that is written in this book. Hukai and those the king had sent went with him to speak to the prophetess, Huldah, who was the wife of Shalom, son of Tokath, the son of Hezra, the keeper of the wardrobe. She lived in Jerusalem in the second district. And she said to him, this is what the Lord of the Lord, the God of Israel says, tell the man who sent you to me, this is what the Lord says, I am going to bring disaster on this place and its people. All the curses written in the book that have been read in the presence of the king of Judah, because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods and provoked me by anger, to anger, by all that their hands have made, my anger will be poured out on this place and will not be quenched. And tell the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire the Lord, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, concerning the words you heard. Because your heart was responsive, and you humbled yourself before God, when you heard what he spoke against this place as people, and because you humbled yourself before me, and tore your robes and wept in my presence. I have heard you, declares the Lord. Now I will gather you to your fathers, and you will be buried in peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster I'm going to bring on this place and on those who live here. So they took her answer back to the king. God's answer to the king reflects God's knowledge of the hearts of people. God knew that the heart of Josiah was repentant. He humbled himself before God. He recognized the sin, confessed it, and repented of it. And God gave him peace. But as we see before and after Josiah, the people forsook God and burned incense to other gods. Their change of mind was only temporary. This provoked God to anger, which would be poured out on the people and not quenched. But because of Josiah's humbling himself, God would not bring judgment during his life. Then the king called, in verse 29, then the king called together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. He went up to the temple of the Lord with the men of Judah, the people of Israel, and all the people from the least to the greatest. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the temple of the Lord. Not only did he stand there and listen to it being read to him, he then took it and he read it to all the people. The, the king, verse 31, the king stood by his pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord and keep his commands, regulations, and decrees with all his heart and all his soul, and to obey the words of the covenant written in this book. Then he made everyone in Jerusalem and Benjamin pledge themselves to it. 
The people of Jerusalem did this in accordance with the covenant of God, the God of their fathers. Josiah removed all the detestable idols from all the territory belonging to the Israelites, and he made all who were present in Israel to serve the Lord their God. As long as he lived, they did not fail to follow the Lord, the God of their fathers. Not only did Josiah read the word of the Lord, he gathered the, the leaders and many of the people together and he read it to all the people and he set an example, an example to the people of repentance, of dedicating himself to obeying the Lord and following him. God's word had made such an impact on Josiah's life. Well, that's an important example, I think, for us. We need to be reading aloud God's word to people and when we hear the word of god it's not enough to agree with it we need to act on it and as the people did we need to remove all the detestable things in our lives and to follow the lord as well as reading the word of the lord and leading the people to follow the lord josiah celebrated the passover in a big way in chapter 35 verse 1 it says Josiah celebrated the Passover to the Lord in Jerusalem. And the Passover lamb was slaughtered on the 14th day of the first month. He appointed the priests to their duties and encouraged them in the service of the Lord's temple. He said to the Levites who instructed all Israel and who had been consecrated to the Lord, put the sacred ark in the temple that Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, built. It is not to be carried about on your shoulders. Now serve the Lord your God and his people Israel. Prepare yourselves by families in your divisions, according to the directions written by David, king of Israel, and his son Solomon. Stand in the holy place with a group of Levites for each subdivision of the families of your fellow countrymen, the lay people. Slaughter the Passover lambs. Consecrate yourself and prepare the lambs for your fellow countrymen doing what the Lord commanded through Moses. Josiah provided for the lay people who were there a total of 30,000 sheep and goats for the Passover offerings and also 3,000 cattle, all from the king's own possessions. His officials also contributed voluntarily to the people and the priests and Levites. Hilkiah, Zechariah and Jehiel, the administrator of God's temple, gave the priests 2,600 Passover offerings and 300 cattle. And Conaniah, along with Shemaiah and Nathaniel, his brothers and Hashabiah, Jeel and Josabad, the leaders of the Levites, provided 5,000 Passover offerings and 500 head of cattle for the Levites. The service was arranged and the priests stood in their places with the Levites in their divisions as the king had ordered. The Passover lambs were slaughtered and the priests sprinkled the blood handed to them while the Levites skinned the animals. They'd set aside the burnt offerings to give them to the subdivisions of the families of the people to offer to the Lord as it is written in the book of Moses. And they did the same with the cattle. They roasted the Passover animals over the fire as prescribed and boiled the holy offerings in pots, cauldrons and pans and served them quickly to all the people. What a Passover. As well as all the lambs that the people had brought, that who had lambs, Josiah and some of the leaders gave 37,600 lambs and 3,800 cattle. These were all killed, skinned, and roasted all on the same day. And the, and the meat was distributed to those who brought it out. What an example of serving one another. The Passover is, a symbolic, is symbolic of a change of life. The Passover is a remembrance of Egypt left behind and the promised land ahead. And the leaven represents Egypt or the way of the world. And for seven days, the bread was eaten without leaven. 
This is an illustration of leaving the old behind and facing the new, dying to the old life. And it's the same with similar to baptism, where we die to the old life. It's a symbol of dying to the old life and rising to the new life. And here again, we see a picture of body life. Josiah and the other leaders provided land for those who did not have one and couldn't afford one. The lambs were sacrificed by the priests and then were eaten by the people and all the Levites and all the singers and the gatekeepers who were the workers. They didn't have to go wandering around and leave their posts because the food was brought to them. At the end of verse 19, it says, this Passover was celebrated in the 18th year of Josiah's reign. The next verse, in verse 20, it says, after this, when Josiah had sent the temple in order, Necho, king of Egypt, went up to fight at Carchemish. Between verse 19 and verse 20, we've got 13 years. In verse 21, I'm oh, sorry, in verse 20, it says, Josiah marched out to meet him in battle. But Necho sent messengers to him saying, what quarrel is there between you and me, O king of Judah? It is not you I am attacking at this time, but the house with which I am at war. God has told me to hurry. So stop opposing God who is with me or he will destroy you. Very interesting comment coming from the king of Egypt. Josiah, however, would not turn away from him, but disguised himself to engage him in battle. He would not listen to what Nico had said at God's command, but went to fight him on the plain of Megiddo. Archers shot King Josiah and he told his officers, take me away, I'm badly wounded. So they took him out of his chariot, put him in the other chariot he had and brought him to Jerusalem where he died. He was buried in the tombs of his fathers and all Judah and Jerusalem mourned for him. Here we have this guy, Nico from Egypt, and he's going to Carchemish. Carchemish was way north of Israel. However, I find it very interesting that Josiah went out to meet him in the Valley of Megiddo. The Valley of Megiddo is not anywhere in the land of Judah. The Valley of Megiddo is near Mount Carmel, which is three quarters of the way up the coast, near the north of what was the land of Israel. That was where Josiah met the king. Now, if the king of Egypt is coming from Egypt down here, how he got to there well, I can see two possibilities, but both of them have got problems. The first is that he could have got ships and gone across. However, going across by ship to near Mount Carmel would have required lots and lots of ships. However, if he had marched up the coast, Josiah would have met him long before he got anywhere near Megiddo. So exactly how he got there, well, both concepts, both um, possibilities have got their difficulties. Unfortunately, when Josiah went out to meet with King Nico, he did not inquire of the Lord. And it's interesting that Nico says, God has told me to do this. So back off and don't interfere with what God's doing or God will deal with you. It's interesting that after Josiah dies, the first king that was appointed by the children of Israel was removed by King Necho. And then the next king that was put in was a king that Necho put in and his name was Eliakim. However, which means God raises up. However, Nico changes his name. Changes his name to 
Jehoiakim. And Jehoiakim means Jehovah raises up. So this king of Egypt uses the name Jehovah. Jehovah raises up, he changed his name. But not only did Josiah ignore the word of God, but he also disguised himself. He used the deception to come out against his king. And unfortunately, the result was that even though he was trying to hide himself, he was still killed. Nico was going to go to war with Carchemish, and he said he was doing it by God's command. Josiah was killed and he was taken back to Jerusalem where his body was buried with his fathers. And in verse 25, we have a mention of, jo of Jeremiah the prophet. Jeremiah composed laments for Josiah. And although this is the first mention we have of Jeremiah, he would have been very familiar with Josiah's efforts. As Jeremiah's father was Hilkiah, the high priest that Josiah had a lot to do with. He was involved in the temple restoration and the Passover. And as we look back over Josiah's life, we are reminded of the need to remove those things in our lives that will cause us to trust them rather than trusting God. The need to put the old life behind us and to keep the new life in front of us. The need to work together, serving each other and building up the body of Christ. The need to give priority to reading God's word and to hear what God is saying to us. And the need to take time to pray, to ask God's direction for decisions in our lives. Let's pray that God will help us to do that. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your word. And Father, I pray that as we've heard your word this morning, that we will be challenged. Father, I pray that our lives will be changed, that we will be following you and serving you and encouraging each other. Father, I just pray that you'll really help us because we do need your help. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.